The Songwriter, Chapter 14 A Hard Call It was October 1991 I got off the plane in Sydney. Life had a new meaning for me now, and every day was a bonus. I felt lucky to be alive, and I went to pick up my suitcases there in the baggage collection area at Moscow Airport. I could hardly believe what I saw. There was a big yellow ribbon tied around my suitcase as it came down towards me on the moving carousel. And to this day, I have no idea who was responsible for that. After I collected my suitcase, I walked off to a city that I had left behind. With the arrivals now in view, I had a feeling that I was in a new place, somewhere where I'd never been before. Part of me felt like a stranger on the shore, just me and my suitcase and a six-string guitar. But I knew it wouldn't take long for me to feel at home again. Over the past few years... I'd become experienced at fitting in and adapting to wherever I had ended up. As I walked out with my suitcase and guitar, I was so glad to see my sister Geraldine standing with my friend Joe. Now, I didn't feel like a stranger anymore. It was good to be home in Sydney. As we made our way out in the car back to Marylands in the car, there were some new songs on the radio stations. The place had changed since I was last there. Now the traffic motored through underground tunnels from the city to the suburbs. There were traffic lights everywhere that I hadn't seen before and roundabouts. I noticed new cars along the way. Sydney had become a faster pace of life now with new developments happening everywhere I looked. It was almost like the city who was trying to catch up on a train that had already left before tomorrow came. We arrived at Jarling's flat in Marylands and she invited me in to stay for a few days until I got settled. I carried my bags to her door and a bag of memories and songs over my shoulder. I thanked Joe for his help when I was in London and I caught up with all of the business of his new wife and children. Then I thought maybe there's something I had never considered before. I had always regarded my songs as my little children. Many of them had been suffered for in their coming into this world. Then the thought about life on another stage had dawned on me and I put it away in the top drawer of my memory banks. After dinner we all called it a day. I had a shower and went to the spare room and unpacked a few things before going to sleep. New day arrived and I started to look for a place of my own to stay. In the morning newspaper there was an advertised flat in Ashfield. It was an affordable place and had a good address, far enough away from the city but still accessible in 10 minutes by train. I checked the flat out and I paid the deposit and the bond and moved in that week and soon began to look around for things to do with my material. Recognition soon came into my life like a bus with no brakes. I had propelled myself headlong into performing my songs at some regular venues around Sydney and the southern highlands of New South Wales. Every Thursday I had a spot at the Barrel Folk Club in a pub they tagged the Syringe Inn because of the number of heroin addicts who frequented the place. My songs were well received by a sympathetic audience. There were many other local songwriters who performed there each Thursday and I got to know many of those people. Dave Debs had a few albums out already and Robert Harpley had a small recording studio that he offered me and helped me to record some of my songs. Stevie Quirk, a local radio personality, gave me a lot of great encouragement with my work. Two girls who called themselves Serendipity were releasing their own material, as was Mick Bevel, Joe Dragon Drums, and a cascade of other artists who found their way to the folk club from different festivals around the country. I was booked as one of the artists to play live at the St. Patrick's Day event at the Hyde Park Barracks in Sydney. I began to push myself into pubs and clubs and cafes to share my songs, and I found a network of connections in the process. I was invited as a guest on ABC National Radio to talk about my time busking around the UK and Ireland. 
other radio stations started to play my songs that I had sent them on cassettes that had been crudely recorded on a built-in mic on a street ghetto blaster. I was amazed that these radio stations gave me some airtime, but very grateful for what they did. Everything was going okay and I was very happy at this time. I found people were interested in my work. I was getting applause and great feedback at the venues where I played. There were an assortment of people in the audience, young and old, tourists, journalists, musos and poets, local identities. I was even contacted by a few band members to put music to their lyrics, which I did, and those songs were recorded on their CDs, which was nice to hear. Suddenly, as all this was happening, another call came into my life. The creative juices began to flow, and something else now was appearing in front of me. It was something I had filed away at the top drawer of a memory box a long time ago. One night I was out with Robert, a fellow songwriter, and we were looking at doing a gig in a bush club. That night there was a bush dance on, and there I met a girl called Mary. She asked me for a dance, and we started talking. Next thing, we began to go out on regular dates. I realised this relationship was getting serious, and the question of settling down arose. Commitment to someone in a marriage is a big decision for anyone. I thought about the sacrifice and the surrenders of many things in my life before I proposed to her. I knew that if she accepted my proposal of marriage that everything in my life would change. One sunny afternoon in the peaceful waters of Lake Entrance, I took Mary on a picnic and asked her to marry me and she accepted. From that day, I started looking for work and soon secured a spray painter's position for a furniture manufacturer. I worked hard and saved for the wedding day and the windows of time had once again started to close. After Mary and I were married, little babies started to arrive one after the other. It was almost always around Christmas when they were born. I remember talking to our family doctor about that issue and asked him if anything to do with Guinness that I had on St. Patrick's Day or could it be even the Irish music that I was playing around that time that brought the babies nine months later into our lives. He had a look through his medical journal and he said, oh, I think it's probably the Guinness. After the first child, third child, second child, Patrick was the the last born just before Christmas 1995 and I stopped drinking the Guinness and the following years no baby came along so I said to myself maybe the doctor was right. In 1996 it was Peter Kearney there a local songwriter who was living in the Southern Highlands at the time putting together a show to go on tour. It was the story left in song about the life of St. Fontaine of Assisi. The Frook Oratorio was called Good Morning Good People and I was invited to be part of that show. Mary didn't seem to mind much so I started to do some rehearsals. That year we had our second miscarriage and I remember writing a poem called A Hard Call that dealt with the loss in miscarriage. The poem was chosen by Penguin Books Australia to be part of Adrian Rand's forthcoming book entitled A Silent Rose. Once again, out of the suffering, many things are created. Adrian Rahn was, at that time, the police commissioner's wife, and she wrote to thank me for the poem which appeared in her book, Hard Call, by Paul McCann. Day after day, the same question keeps running through my head. Is this child we're expecting alive, or is this child dead? The destiny of an unknown answer is yet to come. It's a hard call to take when the hope of life goes numb. Like a ship tossed at sea, I'm calm in the eye of the storm. As miscarriage came, God reclaimed the life of our unborn grief child for the womb in the tomb and the time it was brief when it was there. And both of us felt emptiness like life in the womb stripped bare. So we Perform Good Morning, Good People, all around New South Wales and in the Australian Capital Territory. An album was recorded and had some great reviews. I thought about my own gospel rock opera I had written years ago. I had written the songs for it and a script that needed to be developed. 
The idea was to present the last three days of Jesus' life set forward into present time. I only wish that I had the time and the expertise to put that all together. Maybe another thing for one of the drawers in my memory banks. So, St. Patrick's Day arrived and I forgot myself and had another drop of Guinness and guess what? Baby girl called Tara was born just after Christmas in 1997. Just after she was delivered, I bathed her in a small room adjacent to the delivery ward. And I wrapped her up in a soft towel and presented her to Mary. Now we had four beautiful children, who were all under five years of age. It was at this time when the creative juices began to flow again, fast and furious. And the windows of time had opened again for me, and the children were an inspiring thing to write new songs, new life. I still remember Tara, the youngest child, who was always arriving with cooking pots and a wooden spoon to provide the percussion when I played my songs in the house. Tara always clapped and cheered like an audience. And over the years, Tara was always encouraging me with my songwriting. There were some nights Mary would get out of bed and she'd find me in the back room writing away and ask me to put it away and come back to bed. It was a hard call to do that sort of thing, out there like where the issue of commitment you have to think about in a marriage is important and it takes sacrifice and hard work and so day after day and night after night as the same thoughts kept rushing into my head I learned not to answer the phone I put down the pen and I went to bed being a slave to one's talent is a hard thing but it's much better to be the master and not the slave instead I was kept busy in five jobs at this time, trying to provide income for the family. Mary had gone to bed with severe depression, and I did my best to stay afloat in the stormy sea at life. I had started producing a weekly radio show called Crack with Mac on Highland FM Radio. I was writing a series of articles for a Belfast magazine called Horizon. I was also working as a casual shop assistant in a hardware shop at Mossfield, and I had a grounds person's job in Mittagong Public School. Twice a week I worked with the young lads at the soccer coach in the Mossfield soccer team and I was getting the odd job of painting houses around the district which helped provide more income for the family at that time. Things were hard but life went on and I did the best I could for the family I loved. I started the study of nursing in 2006 and the following year had a Certificate three qualification and started a job as a community nurse around the local district helping those in need of care. The young kids were growing up fast and it was in 2008 something special had happened. Two musicians made contact with me from America. Wendy and Robert O'Hearn had made contact with me about the song of mine, Lost Sons of Erin, that they found on the web. They arranged it and recorded it and entered it into the 2008 Billboard Song Competition where it won first prize in the world category. I asked if I could come over and they said yeah and the presentation for the award was only a week away and that was a very proud moment for me. Two people who had never met in my entire life had arranged and recorded my song Lost Sons of Aaron and it took out the major prize. The song was placed on an album of the duet called Sonic Arias and I received some great reviews about the song. That inspired me so much at the time in my life when things were difficult. And in 2009, I came back home from work and Mary asked me to sit down. I could tell that something was wrong and that something was coming. I don't want to be in your life anymore, were the words she said to me. I tried to talk to her but she made up her mind. She even said that she had a new place to live and they were all moving in there at the end of the week. I didn't see it coming. And that day I felt like I had died. My life had come to an end. I was lost and lived alone in a car for a while. Then a fellow songwriter, Jack McCracken, advised me to ground myself and just to keep doing the everyday normal things that I do all the time. That was the best advice anybody had ever given to me. I started to write again and play my guitar again and I found who I was again. After Mary divorced me and had the marriage annulled, 
I had a steady job in a nursing home and lived in a home there in Bundanoon alone until Tara came over to spend one week with me and one week with her mother. I just worked away every day and kept writing songs. That was my strength and my saving grace. I had given 20 of the best years of my life to a woman who walked away from me and it wasn't wanting me at all. So I wasn't wanting another relationship. I wasn't looking for anybody in my life. However, sometimes life presents you things that you don't choose. Sometimes things happen. Don't you think there's something about that? Not the way you want them to be. For a beautiful woman had walked into my life like a radiant light in an empty dark place and I fell in love with Charity in an instant. Charity was like a gift from God to me and after a while she and her three children came to live with me at my house at Bundanoon. Tara was still in and out of mental health units now every week or so. Her self-harming was a big concern and many times I was almost in the frame of mind I had already lost her. She was starting to have some issues after an incident with a chap who I took her horse riding to. She loved horses and every day after work I'd bring her horse riding. The man there had abused her and he went to prison for three years. After that tar became withdrawn and anorexic, she started to have daily suzudo seizures and Every hospital where she went for treatment had no answer to why and how to prevent them from coming. Over the next couple of years, Tara became quite unwell and often unsuccessfully tried to commit suicide. I found her a number of times and rang the emergency number. Paramedics frequently with her and helped to revive her. I sat with her on her 20th birthday in a mental health unit and she spoke to me about life and I talked to her about the things she was going through. Tara was extremely talented with photography and we had both worked on some short film projects together. One of them entitled Change had been shortlisted in the Wollongong short film competition. I really wish that she had won that because on the 1st of March Tara walked in front of a train at Kagura railway station and that day she was gone. I really wished she hadn't, but I knew that she had found peace. The best way I could describe her, I felt, was to write a song called She Left Me at the Station. A fellow writer, a musician called Dan, helped me to record it.
adapt and rearrange and somehow find the strength to carry That's the end of chapter 14.